I'm a forensic anthropologist. Forensic anthropologists work worldwide today. We help police forces in a number of countries. We're involved in mass disaster investigations, such as earthquakes and wildfires. And we also help teams to investigate human rights, such as genocide. Forensic anthropologists really focus on the body, mostly the skeleton, and tragically and often on the dead. But it's amazing, from one fragment of bone, after sifting tons of soil and tons of debris, that fragment of bone can be sent to DNA analysis where we might get a name. The bulk of our work is aimed to identify the missing. We need other scientists, of course, and need people like you that can help. It's about giving the unknown a name. That is forensic anthropology. In this talk, I will show some images of skeletons. I don't know if you ever wondered, when you go to a museum, is it right to see Egyptian mummies or skeletons? Is it ethical to display human remains? In some conflicts worldwide, sometimes the skeletons are the only teachers of that past. They're a voice about what had happened, the only evidence. And it's necessary to sometimes see those remains. The next image will show a small grave of six people, six men in this case, that were shot in 1936 in Spain due to political ideologies. As archaeologists who are digging up those graves and anthropologists analyzing those bones, we're trying to create a dignified burial. We're trying to provide closure to families if possible, and even justice if applicable. I've started working on these human rights investigations for over 10 years. And only recently did I realize that my great-grandfather in Spain was also shot in the center of Spain. He was taken from his house when my grandmother was 12, and then taken for a walk, as he called it, and shot and buried. He's still missing. My grandmother, in fact, in her 90s, has never told me about this. I only found out through someone else. There's silence. And these images really need to be seen. But let's go back maybe over 20 years ago, when my hair was different, I had more hair, I was slimmer, and my bones were actually different, for sure. This is in my hometown in Ibiza, in Spain. I'm sure you've heard of this fantastic island. But this uh, island has also got a lot of history. I started investigating graves that were over 2,000 years old. And as a young student in archaeology and anthropology, I realized that there's so much information we can obtain from our skeletons about lifestyle, about how many people are buried in a grave, about attitudes towards death and dying that may also help us today. But certainly, the information from the skeletons can provide that insight into the past as well as other types of information, such as objects. So let us go and think about our own bodies now. Think about your bones, your teeth, Think about your lifestyle, your living conditions, your activity, diet. Do you think that was going to leave a trace on your bones? It will. If we had to x-ray all of you, we could probably age, more or less. Sometimes the skeletons can be tricky. Okay, you could be a 60-year-old with a 30-year-old skeleton, or vice versa. But dentition can be used in children and adolescents to estimate the age. Fusion of bones, one bone in an adult, can be between three to five segments in a child. So we can examine age through bone fusion, up to the age of 20, perhaps 25. Then it's a little bit of degeneration after 30. But that's okay. We can also look at biological sex, not gender. Okay? Hips are usually wider due to pregnancy and childbirth in women, but not always. The skull can show different traits. So with the age of the person, the biological sex, and if we measure the bone, almost any bone in your body, we can tell how tall you are, at least within a range. These parameters are going to help identify the dead. We may be having 1,000 people missing in one location, but anthropology can help narrow down that list of, to say, 30 people. We'll, of course, need DNA analysis and other techniques. 
We could sample your tooth, send it to a chemist. We can tell where you grow up, potentially, because where you grow up has different signatures, chemical signatures in the soil, in the water, in the air. The teeth are fascinating. Even by their shape, we can tell you perhaps what continent you may likely come from, perhaps difficult today. But even how foods are prepared and cooked. If you smoked a pipe, if you played the bagpipes for a long period of time, of course. But we can also look at diet, dental decay, oral hygiene. And diet can also be told from your bones. We can examine carbon, nitrogen. We may know whether you're a vegetarian, whether you eat fish primarily, or, or certain amounts of meat. I can't tell you if you play rugby, or horse ride, or play football, or dance. But what we can do is we can look at the muscles, muscle activity, they leave a trace in your bones. Bone is a living tissue. The bigger the muscle, the bigger the bone has to be. Muscle needs to attach to something. Okay? So we can lo look at muscle activity and look at patterns. Okay? So a professional tennis player, for example, their playing arm, that bone will be 25% thicker than their non-playing arm. But I can't say it's that person's a tennis player. Okay? Think about disease. Come up with an illness or disease in your heads now. Perhaps many of the ones you're thinking can also be seen on the skeletons. Infections, congenital disease, vitamin deficiency, joint disease, of course, and fractures. This is a femur, okay, your thigh bone. You can see on the right-hand right hand side of the image that there's an abnormality there. Okay, and bones are difficult to break. Perhaps an engineer can look at bone biomechanics and explain a little bit more what force is needed. But with this, we can also look at care and healing and medical access. But fracture patterns and trauma are also important in human rights cases. Relatives or society doesn't not necessarily just want to know who that person is, but they want to know what has happened. Whether it's death through a machete wound to the skull, or a gunshot wound. So I want to finish with a case that we investigated this May in Spain, in the center of Spain. Not quite from the Spanish Civil War, but just after, so that, that is in the year 1939 and 1940, when these executions took place. The historians, the families, the community, and the social anthropologists gathered information about who is buried in a particular location. Now, many times, these cases of Spanish Civil War, people are buried in fields, in forests, down in wells, or caves. So if you've got that skill, you can also help. As archaeologists, we were looking for 26 bodies with their name, their age, and profession. Archaeologists digging up this cemetery, civil cemetery, with no tombstones, we're interpreting and reading the soil. Is the soil compact? Is it loose? Has the color changed? And then we can target certain areas. Maybe they're not the graves that you've seen on the news. It's not a mass grave of hundreds or thousands of people. They're graves according to the number of people that were shot one day, just out the cemetery wall. In fact, you can still see the gunshot or bullet holes in that wall and some of the projectiles. Okay? Taken because of the political ideologies and executed. Maybe one, one group was executed one day, they were buried in the same graves. Between one and seven people will be found here. And as scientists, we have to be objective about this. This is the image with all due respect to the victim of one of those deceased that we were looking for. You know what information we can obtain from the bones. And even as you brush and remove the soil, you see that gunshot wound to the back of the head. But you'll see there are objects, there's a belt. Perhaps you can see the white buttons. And there are other items, such as someone had pumpkin seeds, seeds in their pocket, or writing implements, or the textiles. Clothing can tell you whether they were shot in the summer or the winter, and footwear. 
these objects actually provide a lot of emotions for families, but also for us as professionals. The aim is really to help provide a name and a face to those remains. So I want to say that forensic anthropology is a fascinating field. We're only part of a team, but we're there to provide a dignified burial, closure to families and justice, if possible. But there's room for everybody. If you're a linguist, if you're an artist that wants through art to make awareness of what's happened or pressure governments, room for those that work in construction that can dig a trench with a mini digger, those that know about underwater um, diving, because sometimes there are cases where people's bodies were thrown in the water. There's room for everybody. And this work shows us that, with education, that these things should not happen again. It shows that people are always remembered. Okay? And no matter what, whether 100 years later, someone will be there to find someone's body and bring back their dignity. Thank you.